we asked the University of South Florida Mental Health Institute to look at our highest utilizers of both mental health services and criminal justice. And they came back with an actual list of names of 97 individuals. Almost all of them have been diagnosed with schizophrenia that over a five-year period were arrested over 2,200 times, spent 27,000 days in our local jail, spent 13,000 days in either the primary hospital or psychiatric hospital, and cost the taxpayers about $13 million. If we just wrap our arms around those 97 people and stop them from going through this fragmented silo system, we will save millions of dollars, give them an opportunity for real recovery and real hope, instead of just watching them continue to recycle through these very expensive systems. The point is, I think we're getting more sophisticated in understanding who the population is and who the court should be focusing on. People have to understand, you know, these are community problems. They take community solutions. The community is going to have to get together. Because if they don't, they end up accessing all these deep end systems that cost the community hundreds of millions of dollars again and again, and you get very little out of it. This revolving door that so many individuals enter into and don't get out of, and the resources that are associated with their non-productive outcomes are enormous. When I've gone to graduations from mental health courts and heard defendants say, for the first time, you know, someone wanted to know what I needed, thought about ways in which I could access care, and actually made a difference in my life, and you start to think, well, that revolving door just slowed down considerably. And here are dollars that were historically spent with no contribution to positive outcomes that seem at this point in time to be making a significant difference in people's lives. I think that's what our taxpayers expect from us. That's what our systems of care were designed to do. And that's really the type of outcomes that we value and are achievable with a well-functioning mental health court in partnership with a well-functioning mental health system. So, yeah, I went to jail, and they come in and said, we're going to see if we can get you into mental health court. And I didn't know, I, I had never even heard of this program. But I'm one of the lucky ones that got in because, I mean, I was right to the end of my, my rope. And I would have probably been dead probably a couple of days, maybe even, a, I probably wouldn't even lasted a couple of days longer on the streets because I was pretty bad shape when I come in here. And things are changing around pretty rapidly now, so... Well, I've, I've learned to be more patient, and I don't fly off the handle all the time. And uh, I realize now that uh, before I did, and then I knew there were some consequences. Now I go, oh, there's some consequences before I do this. So I take time and think about it. it, it it's, it's, just, it's just been really, really good for me. So it gave me my life back.
when our court started the first adult drug court in Charleston County, I worked with that court. And through my day-to-day -day work, I also did alcohol and drug commitments. And one of the things that I saw as a judge, you constantly saw the same people being rearrested, coming to court, trying to do an outpatient or an inpatient order for that same person. And so you kept seeing the same people. The only difference was that you knew that, that person had a mental illness. But the thought of being able to be involved in a program that would focus totally on the mental illness to help the recidivism rate, to know that these individuals, the majority of them were homeless, and that we could use the same type model like we do for an adult drug court meant a lot to me, and so that's why I was actually interested in starting a mental health court and believe that we started the first one in the state of South Carolina. I think it was probably, I'm just going to say, like, my, my last chance at, at, at being, being free and not locked up because I was definitely going to prison for seven to nine years. And luckily, two years before that, I was diagnosed with, a, with bipolar disorder. And that put my foot in the door for the mental health court program because the, the justice system had all but given up on me. And, and so that gave me another chance at, at getting out and, and doing something with my life other than remaining in trouble all the time. So.
I think the central advantage of a mental health court or diversion program is that you have better trained judges, you're accessing services that you might not otherwise be able to access, and there's a greater sensitivity towards the individuals who are in the court system that may have a mental health or a substance use disorder. I often times also feel like the court does the work of engagement, which can be so difficult with some individuals that aren't thinking right or having difficulties with their previous experiences, and the court sort of then comes on uh, with conditions that encourage that individual to get connected to treatment, and they tend to follow through in ways that they might not otherwise. What you're offering them in return is that you're going to give them some hope, some opportunity to break that cycle, because they just may be back in the system again. So it's really a, a tougher program in many ways and requires more accountability. They could just serve their time, be done, be out, and then there's somebody else's problem again. Emergency rooms, police pickups, uh, shelters, whatever, and back in the criminal justice system. So we have an opportunity to try to change their behavior. I like to call it being smart on crime, not being soft on crime. When it comes to mental health court outcomes, first of all, we have to realize that empirically there's much less information available to the field than about drug courts. When we look at the data on mental health courts, that it's clear that you can achieve the public safety outcomes, that is reduced recidivism, reduced jail days, that most mental health courts, most communities beginning these courts want. The reduction isn't necessarily huge what we find consistently is it's about 25% reduction over what the group previously had done or comparison groups do. Those reductions are in numbers of arrests and number of jail days.
I think the really important questions to be answered in, in either local courts or if someone tackles a multi-site study again is which type of supervision is necessary for which type of clients, how much treatment is optimal without being too little or redundant, how long someone needs to be under supervision and does it vary by the type of um, engagement they have in treatment, the kind of support services they have, the kind of housing that they have. That requires collecting the right kind of data and hooking up with the treatment providers, knowing what kind of treatment is being given. Um, because someone is billed for a certain type of treatment doesn't mean they're actually getting it. And I don't mean that it's fraudulent. I mean, they're, they may go to the group therapy and sit there for 30 minutes and they're billed for, it, but they haven't done anything. So getting a little bit more information about the type of treatment that's actually being offered and accepted and engaged. We talk about treatment engagement and we often measure that by whether it's been billed or not. And I don't think those are the, the, the same thing. And I think that local courts could collect that data ongoing from day one um, as, they, as they refer people to community programs, getting some kind of measure of frequency, type, and outcome from the treatment provider's point of view. And I think that would help to fill in our questions of how much treatment, what kind of treatment, and um, be more effective and certainly be, be um, help people and help courts, help guide courts to help people be successful.
At the state level, I have an office of five full-time staff who work with the trial courts to set up these programs. We're divided into adult and juvenile programs. What we do is we go, we meet with the judge, we explain to them how the program is going to work and make sure that this is actually really what they want to do. Then we start working with the probation department to look at their caseload to make sure that this is a program that will really help them with their difficult cases. Once we establish that there really is a need at the court to develop a mental health court, then we will call all the community players together, treatment, the community service providers, the court, probation, law enforcement, and we'll start having a conversation again about the needs of the court when dealing with mentally ill offenders and the resources available in the community. After we have this conversation and everyone usually is in agreement that this is the program that we want to create, we'll have monthly meetings with the group and we'll just work on each part of the program. Usually what I'll do is I'll go in, facilitate the meetings, we'll identify one area that we're going to focus on, whether it be point of entry, eligibility criteria, program phases, and we'll work with them on the details of that. They'll have some writing assignments, and then the next meeting when I come, we'll review what we did last meeting, make sure everyone's in agreement with the proposal in front of them, and move on to the next piece.